Okay. Here is the complaint. As you can see, there are a lot, a lot, a lot of <laughs> people and businesses that have been sued by the family of Helena Hutchins. Now, don't be fooled. A lot of this is focusing on Alec Baldwin, um, but they are definitely going after a lot of uh, people that are not just Alec Baldwin, not just the armorer, Helena Hutchins, not just the assistant director, but also people uh, that are various producers, various other prop people, things of that nature. Some other people that have that have kind of come up in some of the live streams that we've talked about in this case with other lawsuits that have been filed. Um, for example, the the one that was filed by by uh, not Helena Hutchins by Hannah Gutierrez um, against other other various individuals. That I don't know if you guys remember if you saw that lot that live stream on this uh, on this channel by Hannah Gutierrez Reed. It wasn't it wasn't that great. It was kind of a nothing burger, but it just seemed a lot more like it was just her getting her statement out, so to speak in a way that's safer than the way that Alec Baldwin has done so. Um, because he's just sort of like rambling off on his own and not having things checked by illegal, it seems like. So anyhow, let's go through. I'm going to first go through kind of who is like the who's who of this lawsuit so that you guys can get an understanding. So we obviously have Helena Hutchins, who was 42 years old. Then we've got her, her husband or her widower, Matthew Hutchins, her son Andros, and then plaintiff Christina Mar Martinez, who is the the New Mexico attorney, who is the the uh, legally appointed personal representative. So that's the person that is <clears throat> essentially taking on the the role of of Helena Hutchins and sort of representing her estate. Because when it comes to the administration of her estate, she might have a trust. She might have, she might not have a trust. So maybe she has a, a, a probate action that's been opened up in in California because that is where she lived, or at least was domiciled at the time of her death. Um but most likely, my guess, since we haven't heard any kind of reporting about a a probate being opened in this case, my guess is that she probably had some kind of a trust. But even though you have a trust, and this is something that some people have asked me before also, is, is you know, when you do set up a trust, does that completely eliminate the need for probate? And my answer is not necessarily. And this is an example because this is a situation where you have funds that would be coming in even though it's after someone's death, it's it's coming in that's not part of the trust yet. So you have to have a situation. You have to have a way of getting those funds into the trust. So there there may there may be some some probate action in California, but at the very least, we have we have a situation here where we have somebody that is representing the estate in some fashion for the purpose of getting those funds to um, to uh, to to the estate for the purposes of, of administration. So anyhow, so that is, that, that's who plaintiff Christina Martinez is. So those are, those are the three plaintiffs here. We've got, we've got husband, son, and lawyer representing the estate. And, <laughs> and, and yes, Rick, uh, <laughs> YouTube comments, not legal advice. Same thing goes obviously with anything that I'm saying on this live stream. Everything of course is, is strictly educational. So anyhow, um, so then we go on to the actual defendants. Now we've got defendant Alexander Baldwin III. That's Alec Baldwin. I didn't actually realize that his, Alec was not his first name legally, but anyway, now we know. So we've got that. We've got him. We've got his his production company, El Dorado Pictures. Then we've got Russ Movie Productions LLC, which was uh, another company that was, I guess, set up for the the Russ Movie Production. And then we've got defendant Ryan Don Ryan Donnell Smith. That's also a producer for the Rust Production Company. Then we've got Langley Allen Ch Chaney. That's also a, a producer. Defendant Thomasville Pictures LLC. That's another production company that was kind of set up for this whole project. Then we've got Nathan Klinger, another, produc another producer. Ryan Winterstein, another producer. Defendant Short Porch Pictures LLC. That's another production company. Angel Nigam. Nigam, I, I hope that I'm pronouncing this correctly. And uh, Brittany House Pictures, which is 
it's interesting because they they this is one business that they that they were not able to find what form it took, which is fine because you can you can say that when you're when you're drafting a complaint because you can say um, you know, I know that this company exists. I don't know exactly all of the information about it, but we'll find out more in discovery and after these entities and people and whatnot have been served. You know, as as we get more information, we can always update, basically. So you pretty much when you're when you're drafting a complaint, you don't have to have all of the answers. You just kind of give the best answers that you that you can. And this actually so far is pretty good because they they have a lot of information about these different production companies. They kind of know where they're from for the most part. They know that these are either from from the you know defendants that are from County of Los Angeles, California. You've got you've got these other production companies that are you know doing business <clears throat> in the County of Los Angeles, California. You know another LLC that was that was set up specifically for New Mexico. Um, so this so far looks like they've they've in their time that they've taken before filing this complaint, they've really been doing a lot of investigating, it seems like, to, to really get who all should be part of this lawsuit. So then we've got Matthew Del Piano, another producer, Calvary Media Inc., another production company, Ryan Dennett Smith, a unit production manager, which they don't define until a little bit down here because there is another defendant, Catherine Walters, that's another unit production manager, which is generally responsible for the film's budget, the film's schedule, and the general administration of the production. So that kind of like, even though like we haven't gotten, we haven't gotten into the facts that they are alleging yet in this complaint, but just by, just by looking at who it is that they have, that they have added into this complaint, we can start to see that what they're going to be alleging is that the, that the budget was an issue, the schedule was an issue, general administration of the production was a leading to what happened. So you can kind of start to get a sense even just by looking at who it is that they have that they have named in this complaint as defendants. You've got uh, defendant Gabriel Pickle, who's a line producer, generally responsible for managing the budget and overseeing all operations and logistics for a film from pre-production to post-production, reporting directly to the producers and executive producers. So there you've got also somebody who is a link between what's going on on set and then and then the producers. So you've got like kind of this like chain of command almost that they are identifying all of these individuals to say these people had communications with these people and those people had communications with those people. So everybody should have had this information and we can find out exactly from like what each individual knew and which which company they they represented, which which production company they represented here in their actions, in their duties. And so that so that they can they can link to each of these individuals and each of these companies. And basically, I mean part of it part of it really is whose whose pockets can we can we take from in this kind of a lawsuit when when we are getting uh assigning responsibility from from people. So moving down, then we see Defendant Third Shift Media LLC. Um, that is I think another Oh, they 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 contracted with a yeah another production company, defendant Hannah Gutierrez Reed. We are familiar with her. She's the armorer uh, for the rest production set, and so she was. Uh, you know, we 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 know a lot about her at this point, and and what her responsibilities are. Defendant Sarah Zachary. Now she was also mentioned in the Hannah Gutierrez lawsuit, the civil lawsuit that she filed, um, because uh, Sarah Zachary was the props master. And I believe she was the one that had some sort of a, um, a, a I guess, a tussle with Hannah Gutierrez read on set. Um, and so it'll be interesting to see all of the, the drama that we kind of learned about in that other lawsuit coming up in this one. Defendant Seth Kenny was also mentioned in Hannah Gutierrez's lawsuit. Um, he's the, the, I guess the armorer assistant and or the armorer mentor. Um, and he also owns the defendant PDQ arm and prop LLC, which was also named in that other lawsuit. Defendant David Halls, the first assistant director. So we we know about him as well. Um, defendant Chris M.B. Sharp, that is an executive producer. Jennifer Lamb, executive producer. We've got some more producers going down the list. Emily Salveson, Streamline Global, <clears throat> which is another another production company or a motion picture development and finance company involved in the rest production. So they really have gone to try to name pretty much everyone that they possibly can. And then, so you guys, 
might be familiar with this. You guys might not, but defendants does one through 100. So it's always smart when you are the plaintiff's attorney and you, you have a lot of people that you're naming and you don't necessarily know if you've gotten everyone to name defendants does one through 100, because then if during discovery, you can find out from somebody during a deposition or, or during more likely during written discovery from a defendant to say like, Hey, who else was involved in this situation? Um, you know, who else was involved on set? Who else was, was responsible? Um, and then, and then they, they have to give names for who else they worked with, et cetera, et cetera. And then, and then you might want to amend the complaint to add, uh, someone to represent, to, to stand in the shoes of then does one through 100. So doe number one would be, you know, John Smith or whatever from, from the production company. So that's, that's why you would have does one through 100. So this is everyone that has been listed. I mean, that is, that is a massive list of defendants. Discovery is going to be crazy in this case. Um, and, and <laughs> It's, it's, yeah, like I said, it's going to be massive. So, but they really are going for pretty much all of the pockets, which is smart. I mean, that's, that's what should happen, um, you know, it, it, in this kind of a case, because there are, when we're talking about a, a production set, we're not just talking about, you know, so a lot of the focus has been on Alec Baldwin, right? Because he's the one that had the the revolver in his hand and he was the one that pulled back the hammer and then it went off you know whether or not he pulled the trigger that's like a a big um uh a big you know question right so um but uh where was i going with this so but we're talking about a movie set right so there's a lot of pieces involved here and when we're talking about things like not just the actual revolver but then also the 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 situation on set where people were concerned about their safety, cast and crew were concerned about their safety, things like that. We have a lot of people that could potentially be responsible for things like allocating the budget, organizing the budget, you know, um, hiring different people, uh, managing different people that have been hired, things like that. So there's a lot there, there, this is potentially a very complicated case in terms of discovery. But um, the facts themselves are, the core facts obviously are very straightforward. So let's continue on. Okay, so we're going to skip through all of the, the venue and all that kind of stuff because that's, we don't need to go over it. Um, I mean, they, they do talk about how, here how this was a, a joint venture and all of the producers and each of the rest production companies, they're responsible for the co wrongful conduct of each other and for the death of Miss Hutchins on the rest production. They combined their money, their money, skill, and knowledge. They had own, an ownership in, interest in the business. They had joint control. They agreed to share profits and losses. All of that basically is to say, if you hold one person responsible, we're going to hold everybody jointly responsible because they were all trying to act for the benefit of one another and all of their liabilities, they all agreed ahead of time that their, their liabilities would be shared. If, if this movie flopped and there was a huge debt to be, to be paid out for all of the production costs, uh, you know, if, if there were, if there wasn't enough money to come in to really cover all the costs that would be shared among, among all of the different producers and production companies and whatnot. So, and, and same thing goes for, for all of the, the the benefits of running this kind of a a production company right if it was a banger and it made a ton of money then they were going to to share the profits from it so basically all of that shows that they were that they were all trying to uh trying to you know work together for this whole whole project even though they had individual roles maybe so basically all of that goes to um to um uh to uh um what was the word uh, to to alleging that they were that all of the the liability should be shared jointly and severally between them. 